Hey, we're back here at the Epicenter once again. A series of in-depth interviews with renowned business leaders and industry influencers that are shaping today's digital economy. Um, the show is now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, as well as uh, our site, www.epicenter.co. So, without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome to today's episode, Dilbert Tai. Hey, Dilbert. Hey, hey, everyone. And happy, to he- happy to be here, yeah. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to the Epicenter. Um, look, you... you, you you come. You're the CMO at uh, Coffee Meets Bagel, and and I'm sure some people have never experienced Coffee Meets Bagel. I'm sure people have had coffee and bagel, but they just don't know what it is. One of the things, and it, and we'll refer to it as uh, CMB during uh, this podcast. But it seems that CMB has a pretty wonderful reputation um, of facilitating what we call long term relationships or LTVs. Yeah. Right? And uh, the thing that kind of struck me a little bit when I was telling people that we were planning to do this uh, epicenter together, and I said, yeah, I'm going to have the CMO of uh, CMB on, on the epicenter, and they're like, oh, my brother met his wife on CMB. And then I was like, oh, that's cool. And then, oh, my sister just got engaged to uh, someone that she met on CMB. So what, what is the special sauce that uh, CMB is creating? Uh, well, that, first of all, that's one of the perks of this job. Like, uh, um, uh, I get people thanking me for um, helping them meet their partners. And uh, in most cases, since I've only been here uh, for a year, I had nothing to do with it, but happy to take the credit. But um, to your question, what is a special sauce? I think it's a couple of things. The first mm-hmm. thing is, CMB, since its very inception, has always been about helping people find serious relationships or long-term relationships. And that's really set it apart from a lot of the other apps out there. So if you think about most apps out there, they're a lot more casual. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, doesn't mean that you can't find someone you want to marry on those apps, but Given that CMB is specifically positioned for that, it kind of creates this um, almost like a flywheel effect where mm-hmm. people think of it as a serious relationship, and therefore the people you meet there are more likely to want a serious relationship as well. Like they're not necessarily looking for a casual thing; they want to find someone you know for the long haul, and that's one of the things that's really set us apart and really drives this thing. The other thing that we do very specifically is just from how we design the app. Like if you, um, if you use like other apps, there's a larger emphasis on the picture, how you look. Mm-hmm. Um, in some cases, like that's the entire app, like that's the entire screen, right? For CMB, we it's kind of like fifty percent that, but you see other stuff, like you know how old they are, like where they went to school, what kind of job they do. Um, And we see that that's actually a critical thing Mm -hmm. for people to make a decision. Is this someone I want to potentially meet? Someone I potentially want to, you know, spend the rest of my life with. And that's something that we hear a lot Mm -hmm. when we talk to people who found someone and how CMB is different from the other apps. In an interesting way, it's kind of counterintuitive with the typical um, mobile app logic, wherein you want people to keep coming back, right? Right. But in CMB's case, we actually do not want them to come back. We want them to find someone and then just go. Mm-hmm. Because whether it's like you match with someone and you're chatting for a bit, for us, our North Star is actually dates. Mm-hmm. Because we think with if you meet someone for a date, that maximizes the odds that you will really get to know this person and figure out if you guys you know, work together. So that's one of the things that set us apart. Now, how we reconcile that with you know, your business logic, like why would you want people to go out and then not pay anymore, right? Mm-hmm. What we see is like what you've just shared, wherein people who find someone on CMB, mm-hmm. 
they are extremely vocal about sharing that. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, I found you know my person on mm-hmm. CMB. I'm super happy. We actually get a lot of inbounds um, every month where people are just sharing their happiness, sharing that they're going to get married, sharing that they had a kid. And it's 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 a wonderful wonderful thing, um, and that actually drives this additional growth loop where because people hear about it, then other people sign up because they have the success case from their friend from their network, and we see that in a lot of uh, cities around the world mm-hmm. where in we're not necessarily focusing on it or spending money on it to drive growth. It's just growing organically, which is a wonderful kind of thing for us because then your unit economics is great because you're right. mostly organically driven. Um, the other thing that's really good about it is it is a credibility thing. Normally as a brand, to create this sense of credibility, to create this sense of safety, which is super important for dating, right? Because if you're dating, you're technically meeting a stranger, you don't know what's up. And in this case, like the more people share, like, hey, I met someone, and the more it kind of validates the experience, like, hey, this is like a safe platform, this is where I can meet someone who I'll match with, I'll, you know, things will work out. In fact, like uh, I'll give you like a recent um, anecdote. Like we there is like this uh, Indonesian, I would say micro influencer, like mm-hmm. she has maybe like a hundred thousand followers. She signed up for CMB, and within a span of two weeks, and she paid. She paid for the subscription. Mm-hmm. Within a span of two weeks, she found someone, and then she put her account on pause, and then she posted about that. She made you know a couple of IG stories about it, mm-hmm. and suddenly we see this gigantic spike. Like and we're like scratching our heads, like what's going on? And then so we see like our um, social media monitoring tools, and then we find that we got tagged in this thing, and then oh, this is it. And then that's actually a pretty common thing. We're in literally every week. We have someone on the team investigating some kind of spike mm-hmm. because there's some kind of mention or some kind of interesting anecdote that someone is sharing on social media, and that directly drives growth. So for us, this uh, growth flywheel really works. And that gives us a lot more conviction to continue on this path. Like, hey, we're all about serious relationships. If you want to find a serious relationship, CMB is the best place. So so is it fair to say that the the goal is to uh, get people to stop using CMB? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Churn, churn, churn your customers. Churn, churn. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's in, in fact like a one of the uh, we have a uh, we, we have like a uh, hackathons mm-hmm. internally, and then um, one of the uh, cool ideas uh, that an engineer uh, suggested, and he's pretty passionate about it, is hey, is there a way that we can monetize that happiness we're in? If you found someone, um, maybe there's a way for for them to give uh, CMB a tip, or mm-hmm. you know, um, give back their beans, yeah, or give, give back like their, a lysi, a hopao, yeah. uh, something. something like that. Yeah. Exactly, give just me, like what you me, mentioned. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Give me dowry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You have put a dowry button. It's there. a monetization yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, thank you, CMB, for helping me find my, uh, the love of my life and uh, dowry. Like uh, you know, that that's quite normal. But it's actually an interesting question. Like if you, like imagine if you you know um, you met your partner because a friend introduced you, right? Well, what what if we're way off topic? <laughs> but what if there was a way that a an independent third party could actually put people together on CMB as like a kind of a matchmaker or something. Well, um, that'd be kind of cool. That's it. That is interesting. So, I mean, we are kind of exploring something like that, like coming from this uh, Hong Pao idea, um, how you kind of give some sort of gratitude Mm -hmm. we're in. Because like what we know, you know, we we ask our we talk to our uh, consumers a lot, mm-hmm. and we ask them, 
you know, how many single friends do you have? Mm-hmm. How many of them are on CMB? And we do find that there are a lot of them who have found someone on CMB. They have friends who are single, and it's such an organic kind of thing where people will just ask their friends, like, "Hey, maybe you should try this thing." Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, there is definitely an idea there. How you can productize that? Like that's that's something that the uh, you know you we're, guys we're should hook up here. Let me connect you. <laughs> and here are some extra beans. Yeah. So, Dilbert, you're you're like you're a pretty young guy, right? And, and you're a young guy at the helm of uh, you know marketing for a global app. It's not normal. Eh, I would say, first of all. I probably look a lot younger than most people think. I'm I'm close to forty. Um, you, but, you don't look a day over thirty. <laughs> um, well, I th- I think about my career as mostly just a series of lucky events. Mm-hmm. Um, Talk to me about those lucky events. Chart like, that chart that course. Like if you think about like my career, so I've been working for. More than sixteen years, mm-hmm. and I've actually just worked for three companies. Okay, Procter and Gamble, Circles Life, and now CMB. And all of those things, I would say, was just a, uh, in a way, a function of me being lucky. Probably the least lucky thing, the most engineered thing, probably would have been P and G. So. I'm originally from the Philippines. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I aspired for as a student back then was I wanted to uh, work outside of the Philippines. So I thought about like, hey, you know, which companies like you know facilitate these kind of expat assignments? Mm-hmm. And looking at my peers, my seniors, PNG was like a common denominator. So the way I thought about it, okay, how can I engineer my experience in school to mirror that such that it would increase the likelihood that PNG would hire me? So, you know, go to the, you know, join the right clubs, Mm -hmm. have a certain GPA, things like that. Um, And obviously things within my control. I'm not, like, I'm far from the top kind of student. Like, I was like, Maybe you know top thirty percent like mm-hmm. that that like that level. So I did my best to engineer like the kind of things that I had control over, and you know thankfully I I I got in. Um, and I was I would say like this is the first lucky thing. I was assigned on one of the biggest brands that P and G had in the Philippines, which is a uh, Tide laundry detergent. And this is for those really, of you that. Don't wash your own clothes. <laughs> so that's the funny thing, right? Like I never, I never wash, I never washed like uh, um, my clothes uh, before that. And here you are managing a, <laughs> a, a like a big, brand. big detergent brand, right? <laughs> wow. And and that's super lucky because that's something that's outside of your control. It really is just a function of like what is the need of the business, and then you know who's available, yada yada. And then I, I, I was. You know, in that spot, and from there, I was able to work on a variety of brands within PNG, which is again another lucky thing because most of my peers, at least, when you join PNG, you kind of, in a way, specialize in a particular category. So, okay, you're you're in laundry, or you're in hair care, or you're in shave care, or you're in a thing, and you kind of stay there and achieve some level of specialization. In my case, I jumped around. I was in laundry. I was on hair care. Mm-hmm. I was on batteries. So I was working on Duracell, which actually most people did not know was part of the PNG portfolio. Yeah, I did it. I. <laughs> so it was just super duper lucky. And the thing that happened that I think, I actually think is one of the luckiest things that could have happened to me. And I, like this for me is super pivotal in my life. So I was working in Duracell, and this was a time when PNG had a lot of pressure from Wall Street from activist investors. Basically, they were pushing for PNG to become a lot leaner, 
Um, and that really triggered PNG to think about its portfolio and what to keep, what to divest. Mm -hmm. Now, at that point in time, the decision was made like, hey, let's divest Duracell. So I was in that spot. And after the divestiture was done, I was officially out of PNG. Mm -hmm. And then now in Duracell, which became like a standalone company. And that was at that point in time, like I was kind of feeling bad because like, hey, I was kind of thinking I'd stay longer in PNG, I'd try other, you know, brands, categories, and all of those things. But then being in that spot really forced me to do what I wanted to do, which was get into tech. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I, you know, I, I haven't I, I haven't shared this with like lots of people, but what happened there almost immediately after the divestiture, mm -hmm. I was asked to leave. I was given my papers. Mm -hmm. um, now because PNG is From Duracell. Yes. But because PNG is a really, really good at deal making, there is a clause wherein if you let go of people that you've just acquired, you have to give a really, really solid package. Mm -hmm. So that actually gave me runway to explore this new kind of industry that I have zero experience in. So imagine me, I was in Singapore. Yeah. I was given my walk-in papers. I was in a long-term relationship with someone who is now my wife. So I obviously wanted to stay in Singapore. And I also had like, you know, rent to pay and all that stuff, right? And because of this, I had the runway to really explore, hey, what does my career look like if I shift from FMCG to tech? Mm -hmm. And that was like a really, at that point in time, I was feeling quite shitty. Despite the generous package, I was feeling quite shitty. Um, because it's kind of like, you know, being the one being broken up with, right? right? It's not you yeah. who broke up with them, it's they broke up with you. Right. But in this case, um, I spent like six months uh, unemployed, looking and thinking and really, really, really deeply reflecting on what I wanted to do. And in that span of time, I'm assuming that I could have just picked up the phone and, you know, asked for any roles in similar FMCG mm -hmm. roles. And I'm, I think I'm assuming. Obviously, I'm assuming that you know I I'd, I'd find a role like uh, a, a lot faster, right? But no, I I really uh, powered through mm -hmm. and uh, powered through lots of rejections actually. Um, and that's the thing when you're from PNG, you think like, oh, you're a rock star. You are the best kind of marketer yeah, out there. You're the Want, shit. Yeah, you're the shit. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, I just got like a series of no's um, from. Lots of really, really, you know, from big companies, prominent companies to um, startups. Um, and uh, yeah, like, so I really leveraged a lot of my connections to understand, like, hey, what should I be doing? Mm -hmm. Talk to my mentors, um, ask for connections, like, hey, you know, who's hiring? And I remember one specific conversation I was having with a friend. Uh, at that point in time, she was working in tech. She was starting a company. So, but she was, you know, in in tech for a while. So I asked her, like, "Hey, how do I break in?" And her first question back was, "What kind of tech did you want to do?" And I was like, "I had no idea. I mean, I came from selling soap, so I don't. I didn't know that there are all these like different, you know, tech verticals, right?" So that got me thinking, like, what did I want to do? And it forced me to really narrow down uh, how I wanted to make sure that the company I joined leveraged the things that I knew and had experience on with PNG, but at the same time presented some kind of challenge. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really made that clear was I had lots of peers, I would say, who 
left P&G and joined like big tech companies. And they were from marketing in P&G, but then when they joined these big tech companies, they weren't doing marketing. They were doing something else. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do that. I want to make sure like I was still doing brand. I was still handling, you know, the business, being another responsibility. Your core, exactly. Uh, your core competence. Exactly, exactly. And through like towards the end of that six months mm -hmm. of like that's that's the equivalent of me like wandering the desert and mm -hmm. you know figuring shit out. And th towards the end, I I was lucky enough that I had like uh, two options on the table. One option was uh, with Circles Life, mm -hmm. and I got this opportunity because one of my ex managers in PNG, she was friends with one of the founders, and the funny thing is she was saying, "Oh, I have a you know I have a friend and he's starting this tech thing. I don't really know about it, but you know." You guys should talk. Mm -hmm. So I I engaged that conversation and then um, and you know learn more about it. And then the other thing was uh, an opportunity to join Honest Bee. So Honest Bee is is now defunct, but yeah. uh, at that point in time, it was a uh, was way bigger than Circles Life, way bigger. In fact, like uh, 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 something I tease my wife uh, about is. She was saying, oh, you should just join Honest Bee. Because at that point in time, they had expanded regionally. Um, and I eventually chose Circles Life. And I credit this decision because I had so much time to really think deeply mm -hmm. about what I wanted to do. And for me, what sold the decision was when I think about Circles Life and the idea behind it, however nascent, at that mm -hmm. point was really like no one has heard of Circles Life. Like people were like, "What? Like are you joining an insurance company?" Mm -hmm. um, it was so nascent, but the idea was about disrupting this industry, which is basically a monopoly or an oligopoly in every single country, and as a result of that. There is zero incentive for this industry to do better, mm -hmm. and therefore it's a common refrain. We're in wherever you go, whichever country. Oh, there's like three or four choices, and I don't like all of them, but I have to choose. So for me, there was no global de facto leader trying to disrupt the space, and therefore it was a, in a way, still a white space. It's something that I could contribute to mm -hmm. in making that mark. And I one thing I always kind of shared with the founder of Circle Stuff is I wanted to be part of something that people would say there was a before and after. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about like major companies that's changed the way we live, like there was a time before Google. Right. There's a time after Google. There was a time before Facebook. There was a time after Facebook, right? So I wanted to be part of something like that, however unlikely that would happen. Again, it's not like I was joining and like, yeah, I'm going to change the world and it's, it's, it's definitely going to happen. So the way I, I, I just thought about it is there was a non-zero chance that I would be part of this thing as opposed to a zero chance, which I felt like, like in Honest Beast's case, I felt like, hey, um, if you think globally, who are the leaders in on-demand service fulfillment, whether right. it's delivery, ride hailing, whatever have you. There are a lot of these other players that has like a huge head start, uh, millions and millions of you know venture back funding. So the likelihood is closer to zero that I would, you know, change something there as opposed to circles life. And therefore that made it super clear that, hey, I think this is the right thing for me. And that kind of paid off. I think that's super interesting because what you're talking about is something that a lot of people are going through right now. You know, and it's kind of like almost in the opposite direction possibly yeah. because a lot of people from the tech industry have, have been laid off recently. Yeah. Right? We, we know that. And, you know, using your experience, I mean, and you've gone through this. I think many of us have, have been through it before. Maybe we're not as vocal about that. Yeah. What would you say to someone 
you know, who, who's just been laid off and, and, you know, does have that parachute, yeah. you know, of time. What, what, what would you tell them? At the risk of sounding really corny. Mm-hmm. Um, corny is okay. Do the thing that gives you energy. And I, I'm saying specifically gives you energy, not necessarily the thing that you like to do. Mm-hmm. Because there are many things that you like. Uh, maybe you like to play basketball, but you know, you're know you too short. You're never going to be in the NBA, mm-hmm. right? But do the thing that gives you energy and solve something. So for me, I kind of... Uh, uh, abstracted that, like the energy, the thing that gave me energy was mattering. How do I matter? Mm-hmm. How do I do a thing that matters? Mm-hmm. How do I do a thing that I can, at the end of the day, say is attributable to me? How can I do the thing which I can say there was incrementality because of me. And, you know, like, uh, and this is like really coming from my own experience. Like, I love PNG. I learned so many things in PNG. But sometimes at the back of my head, re- like, regardless of how highly I thought of myself, and I do think highly of myself, <laughs> sometimes I think, like, would we have achieved the same result if it was someone else? Like at the helm, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't say that without a shadow of a doubt. Mm-hmm. So for me, I wanted to do the thing wherein there was zero doubt. It was because of you, and I was really fortunate enough to find that kind of role in Circle's life, to find the kind of partners with the founders who believed in what I could do. Uh, the ideas, the grit, the 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 things that I could mm-hmm. you know, really push the business towards, and yeah, like that that sounds very abstract, and I hope it's helpful. But to just mm-hmm. make it tangible, yep. the thing I I you know share with uh, people in general is take the time off mm-hmm. and uh, and really. Wander that desert. Wander that desert. Yeah, that's 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 a good callback. That's a good yes. callback. Yeah, just wander that desert. It's so uncomfortable. It's really really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. I wasn't enjoying the time of my life those six months. I was not. It sounds like a vacation. It's not. I was. Uh, I mean, think about it. Like, I've literally spent almost a decade working every single day. And then now I'm not working and I have to figure out stuff to do. And yes, some part of it you can do like things that you would normally enjoy. I don't know, like play video games, go to the gym. But that's not going to eat up the whole day. So you have to, you know, have the conviction to continue wandering Mm -hmm. that desert. Because you can always take the out. I could have taken that out, like, uh, you know, call FMCG companies yeah. and then apply. And in fact, like the way I thought about it, so that there was some kind of discipline in my thought process was, this was also my commitment to my wife. I'm sure right. my wife would not want to support the deadbeat <laughs> for too long, right? So I told her basically, hey, I'm going to do this and this is my deadline. If up at this point I haven't found something in the thing that I wanted to do, I'm going to be a big boy and then just do this other thing mm-hmm. and then move on. So that's how I kind of created some kind of guardrail in my decision making. So basically, go walk the desert, right? Take enough water, but know when it's time to, uh, to get out of the desert yeah. and, uh, and, and go find something. But don't, don't settle for just a job, right? Yeah. Because yeah. jobs, I mean, we, we, can all, we can all work. Yeah, exactly. Find exactly. something that you are passionate about and of course that you're going to deliver impact. Yeah. And um, again, just going back to to you know being let go from companies again. I, I know that a lot of people are going through a hard time and probably this brings me back uh, wow, even I was working together with my brother once 
And our shareholders asked my brother to fire me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, that's intense. That's a, that's pretty intense. And uh, yeah, it took a lot of guts from my brother, and I just made it super easy for him to say, "Okay, yeah, no problem. Don't worry about it." That that is intense. That yeah. is intense. It's not some. It's not some faceless person giving you your walking papers. No, I mean we were living together yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been an awkward couple of yeah, weeks. Yeah. No, I was totally okay with it. I, I kind of saw it coming, but um, yeah. So. I want to go. You, you touched on something that was was pretty in, important. You talked about like making an impact and and knowing that what you do can create incrementality, right? Let's take this into what you're doing today, right? Yeah. You're, you're marketing a dating app. How how do you like? What is the framework that you, as a marketer, and and using you know the tools that you've acquired over these years of working, like? How do you put this to work in in the company that you're in now? So, I I'm so thankful for my experience because, like, whether it's P and G or Circles, I've taken something extremely tangible and extremely applicable that I can, like, I literally like even day minus one, mm-hmm. I was already you know like applying those things like uh, like for instance in P and G. One of the things that I took away from that is this whole philosophy of the consumer's boss. They know what they're doing. They're making the choices. There's a reason for their choices. In fact, like one of my pet peeves is when I hear people say, "Like, oh, um, the consumer is making an irrational mm-hmm. choice. You know, we can't we can't understand. It's unknowable." Mm-hmm. And I think. What might seem as an irrational choice mm-hmm. for consumer is just insight unarticulated. Mm-hmm. They've just not been able to articulate because it's 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 intuitive for them. And as a business person, you just have to have that humility that you just don't get it yet. Mm-hmm. And if you talk to enough people, there is a chance that you will. But it starts with that humility that you just don't get it yet. So that's something that's super important to me. Like I took it with me in circles. I took it with me in CMB. The other thing, like I found to be really, really uh, an excellent way of of thinking that I took from PNG is is being principle based. Mm-hmm. Like I think very fondly about. Debates, discussions in PNG, where in at the point of disagreement, you abstract the discussion to the higher level, mm-hmm. to a higher principle. And if you don't agree there, you abstract to an even higher level at the point in which you agree. And then from there, the discussion can flow again. And to me, like this is so critical in how I think about things. I try to abstract things to the first principle as much as possible mm-hmm. because that just helps me understand things in a way that I don't miss out. That it it's a lot more exhaustive. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing I took away. Do you have an example that maybe you can share? So uh for example, let's say with uh, um with Circles Life. When I joined Circles Life, I was thinking about uh you know what it is that Will drive growth. Mm-hmm. Okay, so normally, you know, like what is like a gut immediate action reaction you would do? Oh, okay, like let's spend money in marketing. Let's spend money in performance marketing. That choice in itself can be abstracted. Why are you spending there? What happens when you spend there? Is this is this? Are you spending in the place where people will look? Mm-hmm. Are you spending in the place where people are are? Um, in the mind space to engage, for example, then you abstract it further from that. Like, do you even need to spend? Mm-hmm. Like, maybe they're naturally just looking. Maybe there's init- they, there's latent intent that mm-hmm. you just need to capture. And then you abstract, abstract, abstract. So one tangible way is really just thinking about user journey. User journey is a very tangible way of thinking about Growth from a first principles perspective, because you're thinking about like, hey, you know, how are they thinking about this? Like, uh, 
one thing that we would do in in circles is, uh, like let's say let's think about SEM strategy, right? Mm-hmm. So typical <clears throat> SEM strategy, okay. Like let's do brand terms, okay. Let's buy SEM for Circles Life. Let's do competitor SEM, mm-hmm. right? Okay, that's basic stuff. Yeah. To some degree, that's useful. Maybe not incremental as much. Whatever, right? But then, if you think about first principles, it actually unlocks other things because it begs the question: At which point does a person think about switching? For example, mm-hmm. when there is an outage, people are probably searching: Is Delco X down? Mm-hmm. Is whatever? <clears throat> Buy those keywords. That's an example that you're applying this principle-based thinking mm-hmm. because hey. That's how they think about it in the first place. They're not thinking about directly going to a brand because at that point maybe it's too late. Maybe you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have an uphill battle there. You're right? you're already trying to divert their intent. Exactly, exactly. You want to capture that at the you know inception of the intent. Yes. Like another example. Um, That's um, good. Another example is not my example. I just That's okay. having a. Yeah. A chat with uh, someone who was working in a startup that basically provided on-demand nannies for uh, people with uh, young kids. So they were thinking about their SEO strategy, like what's the content strategy. So they would think about at which point in the life cycle of a parent that they would think about having a nanny. Now, I've recently, you know, fairly recently had a child. So my my kid is now like uh, eighteen months old, and during the pregnancy phase, or even before that, like there are a lot of things that you are thinking about, that you are searching, that you are looking for content that you can create content for. Mm-hmm. Right? You can write some stuff about it, and I thought that was like a really interesting application of of, of principle based thinking. Because then, okay, like their strategy for growth would be okay. Let's let's hire some SEO writers, or I mean, now you can use ChatGPT, but yeah, <laughs> true. but yeah, like uh, then then you can get that uh, organic growth like way ahead of the of of the life cycle. Because by the time you know the kid is there, like there are like a million things you wanna you wanna have that impression at the beginning, and you know, so you're 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 not. You know, just there at the point of action, because by then, like you said, like uh, they've already had some level of intent for something else. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Thank you for uh, breaking that down. I think that's very helpful, and and I think people can learn from first principles, right? It's 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 always what you can back it up to. Yeah, right, and and that's where you when you don't know or you disagree. And you go to the principle, and you say, "Okay, well, that's that's our principle, and therefore that helps us to guide the decision that we make." And yes, you disagree, but because we, as an organization, we have to move forward. There's yeah. the commit, right? Um, I like that a lot. Uh, there's something that, um, and, and you know, let's. Shift back to uh, a little bit more about CMB because I, I hear that there's a pretty cool culture there. Yeah, and um, you know, you, you guys seem to be pretty proud of this culture. What is this culture? Um, I would say, if I would, if I were to articulate it, is is it's critical engagement. So, one of the things that I I talk a lot about amongst the team, in particular the leadership team, I love how we engage each other, we critique each other, and and really understand each other. Mm-hmm. It's like a um, think of me sharing like, hey, like this is a you know this is a marketing plan, right? Obviously, as the as the um, you know, like the expert there, whatever I say must be true, mm-hmm. right? But then, the way that I engage with the team is 
they're able to ask like thoughtful questions and then they're really thinking through from their own perspective and that creates so much value. That creates so much value because like as much as I know things, I can't know all the things, mm-hmm. right? I have my own blind spots. And I see this as a really in- integral part of just how we make better stuff. Because then it doesn't matter if you're in finance, if you're in um, CX, if you're in engineering, like, hey, everyone has a voice, everyone has a perspective, you can engage. And I think one of the things that really help with that is, uh, there's another part of our, uh, the way we work is we're an async first, remote first, async first kind of company. And by doing that, you, are forcing people to be a lot more thoughtful. Mm-hmm. I, and I mm-hmm. absolutely love that. I really, really love that because like, I'll give you an example for myself, right? Like, let's say um, someone shares something on uh, uh, a Slack channel where in like, this is, this is a new product design for a particular thing. Now, what I would do is I actually don't respond right away. Mm-hmm. I allocate time for me to think and respond in a thoughtful way. And I think that is really value adding. So you're not just getting you know off the cuff kind of um, engagement. You're getting critical engagement. You're not just saying like, great idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you're not just... It, it's it's like a um, there's a, a a funny Filipino uh, slang mm-hmm. that uh, you would see in some companies. And I'm sure like uh, like lots of lin- listeners could relate. The Filipino slang is mema, mema, mema. So, and it's short for my masabe, which if you translate in English is has something to say. So basically it's a reference to people who just has something to say for mm-hmm. the sake of saying as opposed to really wanting to say something and adding value to mm-hmm. the conversation. And I think for us, given that we're an async first, mm-hmm. if you don't respond, it's okay. But if you respond, you can be a lot more thoughtful in that response. Mm-hmm. And I value that. I think like that's a great way of making sure people are engaged and that you're getting the best from everyone. And saving the last part, which I think is probably like the newest thing that we have in CMB is we're also on a four-day work week. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, this, this is actually a really contentious thing. Mm-hmm. When I share with <clears throat> friends, like, oh, we're on a four-day work week. The immediate thing is like, how is that possible? You guys are slacking off, like, uh, and it's uh, it's quite funny, like how visceral the reaction is. And when I share more about it, how hey, it's it's possible because we have all these other things. We are async. Mm-hmm. We can be a lot more efficient with with time. We don't have as many meetings, and we're super clear with our priorities. We make it the point that we do more with less. Like uh, I have a, you know, like a anecdotal example to just illustrate the opposite of this. I was sharing this with someone in, in, in some kind of networking thing. And then this person was saying like, oh yeah, like uh, um, my boss messaged me on a, you know, on a Friday night. Hey, do you have a minute? Mm-hmm. I need to talk to you about something. And then that minute turned into a two-hour conversation. And in my mind, like that's precisely why some organizations find the four-day work week impossible. Because if you cannot discern a conversation that should be a minute and two hours, mm-hmm. think of the level of discernment at the leadership level for someone to say this is a strategy and not this. Mm-hmm. At the higher level of abstraction, that's almost impossible. You can't discern between a two-minute and a two-hour conversation. How can you be expected to think of the difference between strategy A, B, C, or all of the above, 
right? So for me, like that's that's the thing. And and for us, we make it point to make a choice, hard choices all around. Otherwise, like you really can't do much. And in a way, like it's a part of that culture is like we work small. Like when I share with people like how big CMB mm-hmm. is, like they're always surprised. <clears throat> Like globally, they, there's less than 60 people. Mm-hmm. And we're able to do so much with so little. And it's because of how we work together, how we have uh, documented ways of, of using tools. For example, like, you know, like with Slack. You I guys hear have Slack? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, with Slack, like, I, I hear lots of people who say, like, Oh, I hate Slack. It's the bane of my existence. Yes. Like, uh, it's the worst. It's the worst. And for me, it's if you're using it like WhatsApp and like you know instant messaging. Yes, I can imagine it being super overwhelming because there's so many things that's going on there. But if you're approaching it through an async mindset, if you're approaching it wherein hey, a message on Slack, even if you're tagged doesn't mean you need to reply right away. And we codify this. We share this amongst the employees so everyone knows, so the expectation is clear. That's an example of a hard choice. Saying that explicitly, that, hey, if someone messages you in Slack on a particular channel, you don't need to reply right away. Reply on your own time. And then there's a use case where in Maybe it's an emergency, and you have to reply right away. But there is this distinction, that how, discernment. How do you, how, how do you make that distinction in the communication? So you make that distinction by setting examples. Like what is an like? Let's say there's like, a like P- I need a minute. Like <laughs> no, like let's say there's a P zero issue. Like you know, okay, something is down, or you know, there is some consumer impact, something like something like that, right? Yes. People have to scramble. Yes, it's understood that this. All hands in deck need to fix it, right? And there's a particular channel about that. There's a particular way we'll talk about it so that it's clear like mm-hmm. this is a instant response kind of thing. Mm. But there is a use case wherein it's not and it's okay. And it's defining what that is, making it clear to people so that you're enabling an environment wherein people can work at their own time. Not that, not necessarily like you know, like a, it doesn't mean that working at their own time doesn't mean that you you work slowly. It's it just means you're being intentional about what you're doing mm-hmm. when you get it done. In fact, like one of the things that I've done in CMB that's new, I've not done this before. I've not done this in Circles. I've not done this obviously in PNG. Is I run the marketing team uh, like an engineering team, wherein everything is ticketed. Mm-hmm. Everything you do, please ticket it. Please mm-hmm. ticket it. Please set a time when it's gonna be done, so there is no follow ups. Like one of the things that I would remember that I would do as a leader back then in circles is like I would constantly ask people, "Hey, when is this thing gonna happen? When mm-hmm. is this thing? When is this thing? When is this thing?" And I, I've stopped doing that mm-hmm. in CMB because I've set this process wherein, hey. Everything we do is ticketed. Put a due date when you think it's possible. And what happens is if you, as you know, a team member, you think that's too late, then you have a discussion. Like what kind of choices do we need to, to make to make it happen at this date instead of that date? Or if let's say, you know, life happens, something else happens, it gets pushed back, you declare it and it's okay, like no big deal. You move on get your shit done and this level of transparency allows us to work across time zones uh, asynchronously with uh, hopefully as little stress and more energy as as possible this is uh, this is pretty important because I think uh, what you mentioned is is creating accountability right it's creating this uh, this responsibility Within the organization, yeah, I think that uh, everyone misuses tools, right? It's uh, y- you can have a drill, yeah. right? <laughs> and you can use that drill and drill a ton of holes in the wall, and yeah. right, that's what the tool is used for. But are you really going to do that? Yeah, probably not. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
and I, I, the the drill example came up because I think of uh, uh, recently our CEO became uh, globally famous for drilling a hole in the wall and hitting a pipe. Oh wow! <laughs> and water goes squirting all over the place, and uh, it, it's pretty funny. I'll show it to you. Uh, maybe I'll tag it in that's, the show that's, notes. That's that's one way you go viral. Oh, no, he went like uh, Japan even picked this up, uh, wow. featuring him on like a, a morning talk show. Uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. But going back to the point of the uh, of the the tools, it's how you use it, and and I think that um, you're right. Not everything is is I have to reply now, and and I think maybe if we kind of combine a couple conversations that we've had, if you're joining a new company, mm. right? Maybe you should take a moment to observe the culture before you you bring what you're used to into the culture, right? Yeah. Maybe it's okay to to observe and say, you know, I'm going to sit on the sideline for for a while and I'm going to watch how the cu- culture in this company is and either adapt myself to this culture or I'm going to say speak to someone and say, "Hey, you know, I see I've been observing and, you know, I like this, but what do you guys think of that? And, or why don't you do this? You know, why does the four week uh, yeah. work week make sense? Actually, what's a uh, what's you know, I hundred percent agree with that. Like, uh, I'll take it a step further. Before I joined CMB, I actually uh, this is going to sound really nerdy, but I actually created a survey, mm-hmm. a survey that I sent to the people I'd be working with in CMB. Mm-hmm. To get to know what they think before I, it was a pretty lengthy survey. Mm-hmm. I, I would I would imagine mm-hmm. like it would take them like fifteen minutes to fill out, and I really pushed for you know like the CEO please you know share this with them, and you know so I'll I'll be able to understand like what they're thinking because like the worst thing I could do is go there and then say like hey you know I'm the captain now and then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, like uh, this is the right thing. That's the wrong thing. This, and kind of miss out on all the things that's working, and like really make CMB what CMB is. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like hundred percent agree. Like you really need to understand, like how to get the best of the organization that you're going into, while still you know amplifying it with what you're good at. Have you seen some funny uh, uh, profiles on CMB? You know things that uh, you guys kind of. I mean, I imagine that you observe things and you have a giggle here and there. Um. Well, the the thing is, like, uh, in our internal, like, our like admin system. God mode. It's it's. Look, it's a back end system. It's not designed to look pretty, and it's not designed to you know be. Particularly easy to kind of um, um, see pe- people's pictures and stuff, but um, I, I, I see whenever like one thing that I did like as a as a process was I wanted to make sure that people like key people like uh, had an opportunity to talk to users. Mm-hmm. So we actually have like this automated system. We're in. It will just get scheduled in your calendar, wherein you have an interview with the user for like mm-hmm. 15, 20 minutes, so people stay in touch. So what I do is, whenever I have someone who I'm gonna have a chat with, I'm gonna check out their profile. I'm gonna check out their, you know, pictures. I'm gonna check out their their recent matches, um, and then, like after the chat, I actually give them specific advice, like, hey, you know, your picture here. Your picture with the dog, it shows more of the dog than your face. Uh, that's not best practice. I think like, uh, you know, you, you be proud of, you know, your face like, uh, or or get a friend to take a better picture of mm-hmm. you. So I think like that's like something that I would do like uh, in, in these kind of chats. But uh, I don't think I've seen like something particularly egregious. If we do, we ban. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's that's quite fun, and um, I just want to talk about one one last thing before we go to a, a quick fire round. Um, you also are thinking about your own career endgame. Yeah. What what is that, and how did you you kind of arrive at at that thought? 
So it's it's kind of evolved. Um, um, at some point, I was thinking about an end game wherein I use my experience working in a big company, taking a company from zero to one. Like I think of CMB as a one to one hundred or mm-hmm. ten to one hundred kind of mm-hmm. uh, situation, and use that to you know be an advisor, um, consult. I do some of that now um, on the side, but the thing I keep on thinking more about these days is becoming more of a solo founder. Mm-hmm. So one thing that I've always thought about, and funnily enough. I just saw on my Twitter feed this chart where it basically charted the revenue of a particular company and then the amount of people it required to produce that Mm -hmm. revenue. And the chart was basically on a time series and then it was going down. Like the number of people you needed to, I don't know, recycle a million Mm -hmm. ARR, like just was going down and down and down. And I think with um, AI, all these automations, it's becoming more and more of a reality. It's not just, it's not just a, it's not sci-fi. And if you think, just think long term, like hundreds of years, that is a trend. That is a mega, mega trend, wherein companies are able to produce X amount of revenue with just less and less people. Mm-hmm. So that's actually something I've been thinking a lot about, and and. One of the reasons that's one of the reasons why I picked up coding. So I mm. I thought myself um, I I was thinking, hey, if I have free time, instead of watching funny videos or whatever, mm-hmm. let me watch uh, coding tutorials. And uh, I actually like built a side project. It's a it's a free Google Workspace uh, add on, mm-hmm. and it's something that it's like a nerdy thing I got super into, like mm-hmm. uh, just being productive. So one of the things that I've done when I joined CMB, going back to the ticketing system, I take my ticketing s- system to a, a whole New level. higher level, yeah. which is I actually use tools wherein it will take the task from Asana and then assign a time for me. So I'm not choosing the time. It will just assign mm-hmm. a time for me on my calendar. So it will block it. So then my calendar becomes like a, you know, like just a intimidating mm-hmm. block of a lot of things. And so what I figured was this needs to be color coded so I can, you know, have a glance. And I was like Googling, hey, how can you color code your calendar? Da, 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 da. And surprisingly, there was no straightforward answer. So I I made that Google Workspace app, which just automates it for you. You select the color for your one-on-ones. You want it red. All your one-on-ones become red. Team meetings, yellow, becomes yellow. And that's it. It's 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 nothing fancy, but uh, it was a you know fun, you know, weekend kind of project that uh, I did. Like the the actually the time. The time to build it wasn't very long. The time mm-hmm. to get it approved in the workspace marketplace <clears throat> took months. I'm gonna have to check it out because <laughs> I'm obsessed with uh, color. Oh wow! My calendar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just and check it out. It's a uh, it's it's a plug. So it's a Plantone, P L A N T O N E uh-huh. dot app A P P. Great name too. You should. Uh, my wife deserves all the credit. I came up with like a series of names. I even used Chat GPT to come up with more uh-huh. names. And I asked my wife, "Hey, can you take a look at this list of names and which one do you think is nice?" And she said, "All of them suck. How about <laughs> this name?" And I was like, "That's it." So she deserves the credit. Oh, I love that. Cool. Um, how about some quick uh, rapid fire questions? Are you ready for this? Yes. Go ahead. All right. Coffee or bagel? Coffee. Why? I need that burst of energy. Uh-huh. I wake up 5 a.m. in the morning. Okay. So I, I need that coffee. What, what is the most interesting thing that you learned about your own DNA while you were at Circle's Life? How much I can 
push the boundary of outrage. So I did a lot of funny things at circles, mm-hmm. which some of which worked and drove viral growth. Some of it, some of them fell flat. But uh, yeah, like uh, I, I had a lot of fun either way. Drive like you stole it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best thing about the Philippines? Uh, sisig. 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 I can't like. Uh, it's the thing I miss the most living in Singapore. Not having good sisig. Uh, and and who who is the most inspirational person to you? Um, it's gonna be a corny answer, but I would say my wife. Mm-hmm. So I'm inspired by my wife. How she is just balancing her her exceptionalism at work at everything that she does mm-hmm. at at taking the lead in in raising our son it's just mm. um and yeah dealing with me that's awesome shout out to your wife um you wake up at 5 so what's your what's your morning routine I wake up at uh, specifically 5.50. So the alarm is set 5.30. Mm-hmm. I press news exactly three times. Mm-hmm. So I'm up 5.50. And then I wash my face. So I'm a bit more awake. Then I turn on the Zoom. So I have my meeting. Wow. Uh well, you talked about sisig already, so I know your favorite food, don't I? Actually, no. That's my favorite food is smashed cheeseburger. Smashed cheeseburger. All right. So it's it's like the, it's the in and out style, in and out style. Awesome. And uh, my last question for you: a table for four, you plus three. Who are those people? Mindy Kaling, SBF. And Sam Altman. Sam Altman. He's pretty popular right now, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. Chat GPT. Open AI. Dilbert, this has been amazing. It's been fun. It's been fun, man. Thank you so much. Thank you.